Welcome to the Health Beyond Research Innovation Showcase for the South West Sydney IBD Research Group Academic Seminar. First, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on and to remind people that we are on Aboriginal land. I'd like to acknowledge the elders past and present and in particular those attending today's event. My name is Professor Susan Connor and I'm the head of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Service in South West Sydney Local Health District I'm, and I'm the chair of today's event. I'd like to draw your attention to the Q&A on the top of your screen and please add any questions you'd like to to that function, please, so you can see what questions particularly have for Professor Jane Andrews and for our patient advocate today, Rose Mitchell. It's a pleasure to invite Professor Les Bocay, Director of Research for South Western Sydney Local Health District, to deliver the opening address. Thank you, Les. So thank you very much, Susan, and welcome to everybody. I hope you can see in there. I have tucked in between very important people. Um, so I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting. And I'd like to pay my respect to elders past and present. And importantly, I'd like to reflect on the billions and billions of Aboriginal footsteps that have walked this land long before we came. I'd like to welcome uh, Susan, Connor, Professor Susan Connor, and congratulate her on her recent professorship at the University of New South Wales and her group. They've done some outstanding work in South West of Sydney LHD, and in particular work on Crohn's colitis. For those of you who don't know what inflammatory bowel disease is, you will learn what it is by listening to Susan and her guests here today. It is uh, a condition that affects primarily younger people, but it can also affect not so young people like myself at times. I'd like to welcome in particular Professor Jane Andrews. And Jane, welcome to the Ingham Institute and to South West Sydney LHD. I know we met many, many years ago when we were both at Concord Hospital. Um, and you are now a professor of gastroenterology in um, at the University of Adelaide, and you also importantly the lead of the gastroenterology stream, um, which includes gastroenterologists, um, surgeons, um, and um, I think importantly, um, uh, specific interests in, 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 in psychology and the, um, the impact that allied health can have on patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So, that's an important aspect of the management of patients with inflammatory bowel disease. I'd like to also acknowledge uh, other contributors, Alexandra Sepke, clinical nurse consultant. Have oh, I got your name correct, Alexandra? On Sepke. Excellent. Uh, Joseph Pipicelli, Pipicella, head of operations of Crohn's Colitis Cure. Uh, Rose Mitchell. Um, and all other colleagues and distinguished uh, guests who have joined this uh, symposium. So welcome to you all, and I look forward to um, hearing uh, from you, Susan, and your guests, and learning from you as well. Thank you, Liz. So why are you all here today? Well, the three things I want you to get out of this um, is firstly to gain an understanding of inflammatory bowel disease, which is Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. These are terrible diseases which we do not talk about, but we should be, they're now affecting 5 million people worldwide and is rising in prevalence, and we cannot get away from this. 230,000 people will be affected in Australia by 2030. I secondly want you to understand how our research locally is actually relevant to all chronic inflammatory diseases. And for you to understand that after cancer, chronic inflammatory diseases are now the second biggest growth area in terms of research health expenditure internationally. And thirdly, and I think most importantly, how our research is relevant to all health in terms of getting value for our health care for all of us, the patients, as we now know as consumers, the providers, us, and our funders. And I'm incredibly grateful for Jane Andrews as a pioneer in this area to be able to speak to us today. I'd like now to introduce Alexandra Secchi, who's a clinical nurse consultant with our IBD service here and is also the chair of IBD Nurses Australia, who's going to give you some more insight into these diseases. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Susie. 
So what are we um, actually talking about when we're speaking about inflammatory bowel disease? What is it? So it's really important to note that inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, is not IBS. IBS is irritable bowel syndrome. Syndrome IBD is inflammatory bowel disease. There are very clear distinctions here. IBS is a functional gut disorder and inflammatory bowel disease is an immune regulated disease of the gastrointestinal tract for which at the moment there is no cause and the limited treatments and no cure. So when we're talking about IBD, the three main diseases we're talking about are Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis and IBDU or IBD unclassified. Uh, that's whether there's not that when there's not a clear determination um, as to whether it's uh, classified as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Common symptoms of IBD include diarrhea, bloating, significant abdominal pain, fatigue, weight loss, and passing of blood or mucus in the stool. There are also very many symptoms that not only involve the physical side of things, but the psychological impact on patients is incredibly um, prevalent. Uh, the disease has periods of flares and remission. And whilst we are getting better at using biomarkers to predict periods of flare and remission, we aren't quite there just yet. So the disease course, and as uh, Rose will speak to you further about, um, the, the journey with this disease can be very, very frustrating um, and uh, patients can feel quite well for very long periods of time and then for seemingly no reason at all uh, have a flare and Rose will, as I mentioned, speak to us about that. As Professor Bouquet did also mention, it's IBD seen as a young person's disease. So 25% of patients are diagnosed um, when they're less than 18 years of, um, of age. So this is a lifelong disease, it's a chronic disease, uh, and the impact on the, not only the patient but the healthcare system is very significant uh, given this, um, this age of diagnosis. As I mentioned, there are limited treatments and there is currently no cure. Um, and as Susie mentioned, there is rising prevalence, so 2% of the population by 20. So to give you a better picture of, um, of what it might be like to live with Crohn's disease, uh, live with IBD, I'm sorry, um, I'm going to take you through a scenario. So if you put yourself in this position and actually, you know, we can see that there are, you know, 60 participants on this uh, webinar so far, and there's probably someone on this um, webinar that either has IBD or there's someone in their friendship group or family uh, that has IBD. So think about this scenario. So person A is a healthy person who's planning an overseas trip for three weeks. And person B is a person who's actually living with IBD who's planning the same trip. So person A is healthy. They book their flights and accommodation, very excited about the trip. And the rest of the trip, they'll just figure out as they go. Uh, they have an 11 hour direct flight and there's no significant issues there, potentially some delays with, with their airline or a lost <laughs> baggage, but otherwise no issue. <laughs> um, and their plans in the coming days are to um, schedule back-to-back -back activities and have some group tours on bus trips that may take up to an hour or even beyond. Now, person B is a person living with IBD. So before they even think about travelling or before they even book their flight, there are so many other considerations and you can see those listed there. Things that patient, our patients think about or those living with IBD think about, uh, what if I flare overseas? What if I lose my medications, which are, um, you know, imperative in keeping good disease control and, and compliance and consistency with those therapies is key. Uh, what, what will happen on the bus tour? What if there's no toilet? Why do I feel so scared, alone and vulnerable around this? Travelling is something that we all do quite freely, especially now um, in the post-COVID era or living with COVID. Um, I'm immunocompromised. What vaccines do I need? And are any of those live? And are they contraindicated in the setting of my current medications? Will I be tra uh, covered by travel insurance because IBD is a chronic illness? Um, how do I store my temperature-sensitive medications? Can my airline uh, cater for my dietary requirements? And what about if I need to use the toilet urgent, urgently? So as you can already see, those are lots of serious considerations in undertaking something that should be fairly straightforward for most of us. 
Thank you, Alex. Um, you remember when um, our research unit was first, academic unit was first funded, we actually were called the Gut and Microbiome, microbiome Academic Unit. Now we're uh, like I call the South Western Sydney IBD Research Group as of Friday when Amanda Larkin has very kindly um, uh, given us permission to change it, and, and you'll see why uh, in the next slide. So if we go on to the next slide, please, Rachel. So. The aim of when we got the academic unit funded originally was to use inflammatory bowel disease as, a, as an exemplar of chronic disease in young people. And as you know, it's now the most common chronic disease in young people in Australia. And we used that because we wanted to improve quality, efficiency and productivity and value of care using this disease as an example of that. And we also wanted to understand the role of the gut microbiome in health. And that is exactly why we had that title originally. But what happened concurrently, we'll go to the, these are the four sort of key pillars of our research portfolio at the moment. The fourth one is called the Australian IBD Microbiome Study, and that started almost at the same time we established the unit. The Microbiome Research Centre was set up at St George. And so rather than us leading that, we decided to actually work with St George. I want to emphasise that all our research is done with a lot of other collaborators because ultimately work done in collaboration is far more effective than being in silos. So the Australian IBD microbiome study, we're collecting longitudinally 1,200 IBD patients. Each is collecting samples every three months over two years, blood, stool and oral samples and giving us dietary history as well as 600 controls. And what we aim to do, and this is a multi-centre study, what we aim to do is actually understand how the microbiome over time actually causes flares in IBD and how we might then use the microbiome therapeutically. Our biggest area now is really in value-based healthcare, and this is to use digital technology to inform whether our care, in fact, is improving patient outcomes and is of value. And this is where... Um, Jane Andrews and Crohn's Colitis Cure is imperative. We've actually been working with the IBD charity Crohn's Colitis Cure. We've been involved in design and implementation of the IBD cloud-based software Crohn's Colitis Care. This software is now used in routine care across South Sydney Local Health District. It's unique in that it, while we manage our patient, it populates a data registry at the back end at point in care. There are specified bills that we as clinicians have designed so we can understand what outcomes are actually achieving in real time. The Agency for Clinical Innovation is actually involved in a project now where we are using Crohn's Colitis Care to track key quality indicators across four IBD sites in Sydney and Adelaide for one year and monitoring how our awareness of poor performing key quality indicators and patient outcomes can actually improve care. I want to particularly thank our statistician Frances Garden, Gardner, Garden for her help with this project. We're also very um, involved in patient communication and decision aids. And I want, we really want to understand how patient, improving patient and clinician communication can actually improve patient care because there's often a disconnect, literally the cold face between the patient and the clinician. This is led by our postdoc, Netta Karim, who's currently on maternity leave, and she's got a, a, a PhD in linguistics, which is amazing. And Alpha Gurgis has been helping us with these projects and multiple international collaborators in the US and in Canada. We designed and tested it, an ulcerative colitis decision aid and have now completed a national randomised control trial, helping patients um, manage the decisions around ulcerative colitis management and compare that to standard care. We've also, led by Astrid Williams, tested um, and designed and tested successfully a decision aid in pregnancy, helping men and women who have IBD to navigate decisions around pregnancy during IBD, because as we know, this is a young person's disease, so a lot of critical decisions have to be made around pregnancy and producing children. We're also conducting multiple qualitative studies at, at the coalface, actually drilling down on what actually occurs between the patient and the clinician, and trying to actually improve literally the quality of communication between patients and clinicians, and actually to help clinicians actually better communicate with patients at, and in fact, using no more time. So Nita, we've been incredibly grateful for Nita's work in this area. And finally, perianal Crohn's disease. Now, this is 25% of patients with Crohn's disease have perianal Crohn's disease. And what this is, is basically where inflammation in the lower part of the bowel literally bores through the, um, the bowel wall out onto the skin on the buttocks and the patients then basically leak out pus and feces on the skin of their buttocks. Despite 25% of people with Crohn's disease being affected with, you can imagine what that's like. 
pus and poo literally draining out onto your underpants, that we haven't actually got the treatment in this area right at all. So Proactive is an MRFF-funded study. We're trying to improve treatment by really high dose of infliximab to see if that actually improves our outcomes compared to standard care. And this will also then improve, hopefully, government funding around this. These are all the major achievements we've achieved over the last couple of years. And I won't go on about them, I've outlined some of them to you. And this has actually been in the context of COVID-19. I'm incredibly grateful for all our collaborators and a very committed team of patients, consumers, and all the team, the research team that we work with, and the clinicians and the funders uh, for us to be able to achieve this. I'd now like to introduce Professor Jane Andrews. She is an international key opinion leader in inflammatory bowel disease. She's now the medical lead for the gastroenterology, GI surgery, um, and general surgery in Central Adelaide local health district. So she's now an administrator, having previously been a clinician. She's a member of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. She's on the board of the Gastro Society of Australia. She's also the chair of the charity, IBD charity, Crohn's Blood's Cure. And she also has over 300 publications. So you wonder why she's still standing. So thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Andrews, for your presenting um, discussion about bringing business and digitalisation to healthcare. Tales from the coalface. Thank you, Jane. Thank you so much for having me, Susie. I really appreciate being invited. Um, I think there's a lot we can learn um, from getting into other industries and bringing them back into medicine. And so that's why I decided to um, propose this topic because we sometimes work in our silos and we do all the great research, we don't translate that into care. We also do the great research, but we find things that maybe are too expensive or not able to be implemented. Um, so I think that it's good to learn what we can do so we can be more effective. So in healthcare, I think it's always good to think about who are your key stakeholders. And we've got consumers, and that's not just our current consumers. They're the people who may need healthcare in the future. And we're all going to be consumers as well if we haven't already been consumers. So we have dual perspectives already. And then all the providers are really important. And it's not just the providers within public health and within hospitals. It's the providers in the community, all the allied health providers, our GPs, our private specialists anyone who's providing healthcare advice, even the pharmacists. Um, and then we have funders. And funders, actually, it's us again, because ultimately at the end of the day, while we get money from local health boards or we get it from federal government or from state government initiatives, it is actually all our money because most of us with jobs are taxpayers. So I think it's really interesting. You can sort of pull the stakeholders apart and then put it back together and realise actually we're really invested all the way along. So that's what drives my passion to try and improve healthcare, although sometimes it makes me very tired and get a bit of a headache. Um, but, you know, the other thing, it's pretty obvious that everybody really wants high value healthcare, whether you're consuming, whether you're providing, whether you're funding. So given that this is a universal desire, how do we actually design and deliver that? And I put the word design in there first, because we can't deliver it if we don't think about the design first, because otherwise what we're doing is we're just going through the motions, same motions every day, and expecting a different result. And that's not a definition of being really clever. So thinking about high value care, what are the components of care that would be recognised as high value? It needs to be effective. And actually, even before it's effective, it needs to be appropriate, because we could offer you know, a curative therapy for pneumonia for somebody who's 98 in a high level of care nursing home who doesn't know who they are, let alone where they are. So that could be effective, the antibiotic, but maybe not appropriate. Care also needs to be reliable. It needs to be highly reliable so that the same thing is going to give you the same result day after day and you're not going to have hit and miss and the Swiss cheese problem. Because we all have care that is outrageously impressive sometimes, but if it's not outrageously impressive every day, then we've got a random problem and that's very dangerous for patients. We also need to look at risk benefit because something can be, you know, high cost and extremely, you know, high gain and that might still be cost effective. Something though can be very high cost and actually very marginal gain and that's not going to be cost effective. And I know a lot of doctors and clinicians don't like thinking about money, but actually if we can't pay for something, we can't do it. And if we can only afford it for a tiny fraction of the community, we need to think about, well, is that right? Is that just? Is that equitable? 
and also then who would be deciding who gets it and who doesn't. And again, you can see that we would then come back to something that wasn't reliable and, and wasn't predictable. And so we do need to do the cost benefit analysis. We need to put in all the bottom lines though. So not just money, not just dollars. It needs to be the community, the patient, financials, um, the service that's delivering the care, the staff, everything. And we need to think of the trade-off of the opportunity cost. So if we deliver this, what are we not delivering? Um, there needs to be a co comparison. Nobody wants to do the comparisons, but they're essential. We've got tools to do those, qualities, quality adjusted life years, and we look at incremental cost effectiveness ratios when our PBAC is considering drugs. So what I think we need to do is to have a lot of clinicians closer to the coalface aware of these um, comparative tools and just aware of the concepts so that when we are thinking, am I going to offer that colonoscopy for that 82-year-old who really probably doesn't need a colonoscopy as much as maybe the five 50-year-olds who are in the queue who haven't come forward for their first screening test. So there is an obligation to make comparisons, whether we like it or not. So I think we need to get comfortable with it and we need to do it really well. The big problem in the Australian system is that we don't collect good outcome data and we don't link them to people and to interventions. So it's really hard without designing new systems to look at what was the value in our care down the track after we delivered it. So the other thing that's important to remember is that value in care is highly biased by what we know now and how we do things now. So something that's not very cost effective now could become cost effective if we do it a different way. And that's where digitisation can really help us. So what gets in the way of high value care? If we all want it and it makes sense, why don't we just do it? Well, I think one of the things that's really important to think about is that we've got lots of tribes in healthcare and all of these tribes, and there are many more, but I couldn't fit them all on the slide. They all have a different view. And, you know, if you're being negative, your view is a bias. But, you know, someone without a bias is someone without an opinion. And that's not good either. And then the tribes and the bias gets in the way of communication because sometimes we don't use the same language as each other and we have different values and different meanings attached to the same word. So we can say the same thing and we're seeing something totally different in our mind map. And that's important to be aware of. So I think that once you think about that idea, it's good to think, how can we solve it? And I think acknowledging the problem is one of the first things. And then to actually explore language with people and to an agree on an approach. So since I stepped more into management, I talk more to people with financial degrees and CFOs, and I find that we have these absolutely glaring kind of, you know, gaps in our communication because I said X and he heard Y, and it was the same word. And so it's really important to respectfully pick that apart and find out what the other person is trying to say, what they mean. And I think in healthcare, it's really good um, in terms of a technique to keep people connecting back through to purpose. Now, sometimes in meetings, when we've got a lot of non-clinicians in the meeting, we have a consumer story at the beginning because that can help the people who haven't been at the coalface to actually think, oh, yeah, that's what we're all here for. That's what we're here to deliver. I think clinicians get that and we get impatient when other people don't get it. But that's not helpful. So we need to help explain that. We need to help research organisations and clinical services to face forward to the front door, to the consumer, gather data so that the back end does things well, but we need to keep facing forward and talking forward. And then that's about setting the foundation and agree the intent. And one thing I've learned over many years, and I'm still learning it, I still get it wrong, a lot of the time my children tell me, is that language matters. So the way you say something is probably just as important as what you're trying to say. Um, a good example, you know, the CFO will say cost savings. Like every clinician in the room gets turned off when you say cost savings. What we want to talk about is better care. And what we find is that when we get the care right, it actually is more cost effective because we're doing it once, we're doing it well, we're doing the right thing. So having thought about all of that, there are really good opportunities for business principles to enhance value in care. But we won't do this if the people applying the business principles don't understand healthcare. So you can't do healthcare like a sausage factory. It's not just counting sausages. You need to know were they the right flavour, were they produced the right way, were they going off to the right shop, did that person like it? 
because, you know, experience and outcomes are really important in healthcare. It's not just what happens to someone, it's how they felt about it. And it's how that enables them to go back into the community to be really functional in their life. The other thing that um, I think is worth pointing out to clinicians sometimes is that some clinicians have a bit of a, a hot button when you say, you know, business principles. They go, oh, God, I hate the CFOs and I hate all the accountants. But business principles is just another way of saying maths, data, statistics and looking at risk. And these are things that we as clinicians and researchers do all the time. So use the things that we know in our research environment to help us also make good business-like decisions. So, you know, we talked about counting things that matter, quantifying the value for consumers and for staff and for the systems and for the funders. Make conscious decisions. One of the things that I've found in healthcare is that if you go to a different place and you look at what they're doing, you just say, well, why would you do that? Well, why would you do it that way? We all get very blinkered and siloed. We run along in our little ruts. But it's really good to go and visit other places. And that's one of the things I thought was lovely about being invited to come here today. Because when we share different ideas and we, we ask questions like, why would you do that? Or why would you do it that way? Then we unpick what we're really trying to do, why it matters, and we can make really good conscious decisions. And that helps with design. Now, the efficiency, thoroughness, trade-off principle is a really important thing to be aware of in health because you can be really efficient or really thorough, but there are problems with being too efficient and there are problems with being too thorough. One will drive costs down, down, down and kind of minimise things and may, you know, not be thorough enough. But being too thorough and solving every tiny little thing can be so expensive that you can only do five patients instead of 10 patients in a day. And that's not great either. So just think about these things very deliberately. And we have to accept some risk when the gains are high. I was last week at a um, healthcare conference in Brisbane, around, it was a health round table meeting, and it was around safety. One of the things that struck me as I sat there listening to people is that safety is not a concept you can think about on its own. Because if we have a system that never harms anyone, we will probably also have a system that doesn't deliver very much and is very expensive. I'm not saying we should harm, but I'm saying that we shouldn't over-engineer things. And part of the um, principles that I like to talk about is not over-engineering things, is trying to think in your design how you can make the right thing easy for your staff and for your consumers. Because people only run the wrong way around systems when it is really difficult to navigate. And that creates cost and frustration. So now some examples from the coalface of where I've applied some of these principles, um, initially kind of in a fairly unsophisticated approach with this example. Um, when I started doing all the triage for our gastroenterology service about 12 years ago, there were too many referrals, um, which meant that didn't matter how many new clinics we put on, we could not see all the people who were referred. And many of the people were referred with non-specific GI symptoms. So that was the IBS that Alex talked about where you've got symptoms, but no lesions, no tissue damage. We were clearly unable to meet demand. And so what did we do? Did we just deny care? Did we accept an imaginary queue and put them in the long wait queue and know that they would not ever get seen? Were we to be honest with our referring doctors on, and our patients, or were we to design a new system? So what we did is I was very fortunate to have a great um, PhD student come along, Akushla Lyndale, and her work looked at designing whether we could offer these patients care without seeing them by applying structured screening tools, very simple tests, and by having a non-doctor check all the results according to some really great international safe guidelines. And surprise, surprise, we could do this and it could be done safely. It didn't require a senior doctor to do it. And in fact, Akushla had a psychology degree, not even um, a nursing or other clinical degree. And she was able to ask great questions and help us design a wonderful thing that we ended up building into a website. You can look this up online, www.ibs for GPs, and it steps you through how to diagnose, treat, and educate people with IBS. It recommends simple tests, diagnostics, diagnostics to do and diagnostics not to do, which is very important. It goes through the management options and it has patient and GP resources. And importantly, we chose not to lock this up. You don't have to be a doctor to access this. Anyone can look this up. 
Because if we've got good information to help people with their health, why would we want to lock it up and only let them access really worrying, inaccurate things on Google? So this simple digital tool was designed, um, informed by research and consultation. It democratises access to quality information and it uses a digital enabler. It was really cheap after we did the initial resource allocation. This website came in on time and under budget in terms of design because it only um, holds information and gives it out. It doesn't need to have PII or um, privacy security concerns. It's a really good capacity building tool because we're not locking up the information, we're giving it out to our consumers, both GPs and patients, and it removes routine tasks from expensive frontline staff. Um, we thought that this was a good sort of example that if we had been a for-profit business, putting more resource in here would have been a business opportunity. But because we're a public health system, putting more business in here and more staff would have just led to other people waiting a lot longer. So that was quite simple. Another digital opportunity to enhance value in care was developing the Crohn's Colitis Care software, which is um, a lot more involved and is still being optimised and worked on today. And we've recently built the paediatric functionality, which is under beta testing at the moment. As uh, Professor Connor mentioned, this now documents care for over 10,000 people across Australia and New Zealand, and it's all cloud-based. Um, so that's a, a fabulous example. We're also um, within Carlin looking at implementing a product called Ainsoft, which is a trend-based digital alerting system, which harvests data out of your EMR and runs a little prediction algorithm for risk of deterioration. It gives the clinical staff at the bedside a risk every 10 minutes. We're also looking at evaluating a prehab pathway, and I'll show you a little bit about that later. We're doing digital pathways for routine endoscopic work so that all the repetitive, boring tasks that can be described really well and are safe to deliver remotely are being delivered remotely. And we're also working on a new tool now to um, enhance flow in our hospitals uh, because, like everywhere, we have more people in beds in hospitals than we have um, beds. And so planned care and elective surgery is actually really difficult for almost all of our services at the moment. So we're trying to have some conscious design to improve that. A little bit about the Crohn's Colitis Care software. It's an EMR and a registry. And because you've got digital data, you can use the digital data to give you KPIs all the time. So you see up in the top corner here on the left-hand side, this is the percentage of patients with clinically active disease, um, which is updated live all the time and this uh, these are data from my site and it's running around 16 percent percentage of patients on steroids this is something we like to keep low and very very happy to say it's between one and a half and two and a half percent use of opiates because opiates are a marker for potential poor outcomes and potentially unsatisfactory disease control we also look at anemia smoking and vaccination this is an example of what the front page of the EMR looks like for these patients. And what you can see is that we've used nice graphic display to show what drugs people are on in a timeline. We've got um, a lot of tabs down the side here, but it's a nice, simple user interface. So it's good for clinicians to use at the front end, and it's giving us really helpful data at the back end, which we're already starting to analyse now in the ACI grant that Susan mentioned. So the opportunities from these data are huge because we can get real world evidence in IBD care as it happens. We can look at value, we can look at efficacy, we can look at getting data out for advocacy, for resourcing. We're going to be producing um, a report shortly on the state of the nations between Australia and New Zealand in IBD care. And we've got these KPIs that we can report on continuously all the time without having to go and run an audit. And the aims of our charity are to optimise care now and be instrumental in cure. And that's a really strong shared value that Susan and I have and all of our teams, which is why we do so much work together. So coming now to something which I haven't designed, but I found online and am an advocate locally for our LHN purchasing and implementing. This is thinking about the deteriorating patient. Now, all hospitals have their static warning systems for deteriorating patients. And that's basically an escalation tool. After someone gets sick and they're outside the flags, then you call for help. But if we think about it, most patients 
have an injury, either they come in sick and they've had their injury in the community or we admit them and we injure them with surgery or a procedure. And then we may give some preventative therapy or some therapy that's going to ameliorate that um, injury or we might not. And then there's this insult response delay. And the longer that gets, the more people get to the uh, steep end of the curve and the more risk there is that we will not be able to rescue the person. So the current scenario for deteriorating patients is that we've got static risk scores. We may or may not see the insult. We monitor patients, but we don't respond until there's an escalation trigger. We've got reactionary old-fashioned static systems, and it's not in line with best practice in other industri industries. So we're better at prediction if we're experienced and paying attention, but we know we're not working in a perfect environment. People are tired sometimes, they're distracted, there are too many people who need attention at once, and so we need a safety net system. Data can be harnessed using di digital techniques to put, if you like, an experienced clinician who's predicting things at the foot of every bed. And this is where the fun starts. So just quickly, we can see this is a New South Wales chart um, that shows respirations, um, saturations, BP, and then pulse rate, and we get static results. We can't really tell if this patient's sick, but then we get a second set of results. They look, hmm, that's not so great. And then we get another set of results. And I think we can all agree that this patient is sick. But the very interesting thing is that if we had a trend-based system, we would have seen that a full 24 hours before, the patient already showed respiratory rate was going up, SATs were going down, BP was trending down. And when we use this um, Ainsoft trend-based alerting algorithm, the actual alert went off on this second set of OBS here and there would have been time for clinicians to implement better care. So using this system, it's now been actually running live at the Sydney Adventist Hospital in Warunga um, for well over a year. And these are their data from their first 10 months of running the system. It's a large 500 bed acute care hospital, which does cardiothoracic surgery, major cancer surgery, all the usual things. And what you can see is that the um, prediction algorithm in the red outperforms the between the flags in the blue on very important measures. It predicts death, met calls and unplanned ICU well out more than 24 hours before the events. Very impressive. So that's nice maths, but what does it mean? For real patients, what it means is that in that 10 month period, your relative risk of having an adverse event, which was the summary of met calls, unplanned ICU or death, was statistically reduced and that was highly st statistically significant. Also, it's very nice that these measures down the bottom here show how that happens and they're physiologically valid me um, measures. So you don't get as acidotic and that's because you keep your blood pressure higher and you're discharged from hospital with less renal impairment. And this is my favourite one, the less renal impairment, because that means we're actually not having those people come back with preventative pre preventable renal disease in a few years' time. So we've actually saved future healthcare in these people. Now, for a hospital, it's great because you get reduction in length of stay as well. And this is all around conscious decision-making. If you see that someone is likely to get sick tomorrow, if you don't give more fluids, antibiotics, whatever today, you're going to do it today and you end up with 165 fewer ICU bed days used. This is the 10 months at the SAN. And you actually send people home sooner and they gained five and a half thousand occupied bed days. And you can see the maths there. So you can do more elective surgery. You can do you know, more effective care. You're sending people home safer, more well, and you're sending them home sooner. So it's good all around. It's also good for the ward nurses because they can drag the beds around and they can design their ward. And you can see at a glance who is sick on your ward and you can see why. Because if you hover over any of these little scores, it'll tell you blood pressure's trending up, pulse rate is trending down, saturations are off, and it also pulls in some key pathology results. You can also then, because it's digital, you can summarise it as a whole of hospital view. And you've got your little line under the wards. And you can see this ward is probably the sickest ward. It's got a red and two orange patients. Most of the other wards have only got blues. So you're going to send your senior nurse to the sickest wards and you're going to start your medical rounding overnight on the sickest wards. 
We looked at this in our Carlin data just to see whether we thought it was safe to go ahead because some people locally thought that um, biology might have been different in South Australia. Um, fortunately, we discovered it wasn't. <laughs> and what we saw was that these were the false positives. So if you look at all the normal escalation triggers that we get, and this is your between the flags, we call them the RDR charts, um, you get a lot of false alarms. This is the AIMSOFT. There's very few false alarms, which were defined as an alarm went off and the patient didn't get a MET call or an ICU within the next 48 hours. And there was no loss of sensitivity. So you went from getting 10 calls to one call. And you can imagine what that's going to do for your staff. It's going to make the right thing easy. It's going to take stress out of the night shift. Um, just quickly, I know I'm running out of time. I get very enthused talking about these um, things, so I'm sorry about that. But this is... Um, We've now gone with a digital prehab pathway. So our patients now, if they're referred to see a surgeon for something in the elective care space, they are invited to self-register on their mobile device and go through and do a whole um, survey on their health and what might be good, what might not be good. They get a printout of a summary saying these would be good things for you to think about and also to go and see your GP about. And by the way, if you want some good information, go to our website and you can get resources. Anyone can look this up. If you type in Carlin Prehab, you will get onto this website. Feel free to use, lift, do whatever. They're all um, open access. So in terms of business and digitisation, the things that I've learned, the kind of challenges and also the things that are good to be mindful of, is I've been really surprised when you talk to clever clinical people that it's a little bit difficult to convince people that um, business and digital approaches are real and safe. So I've had to get more persuasive and talk different ways to people. Navigating permissions, so being allowed to use a digital tool, that's another difficult thing because I think healthcare is quite risk averse and that's a problem because the risk aversion is for doing something and that means that we continue to discount the risks of doing nothing. And the risks of doing nothing are much bigger. And I think the AIMSOFT data show that very, very clearly. It's really important that you get in front of your key stakeholders. Um, sometimes you need to step around some of them and come back later when they've been convinced or they've had more of a think about it. The really great thing, though, is that the frontline clinicians and, in fact, our consumers have been the quickest to engage. People said, oh, you won't get 80-year-olds and 70-year-olds referred for colonoscopy doing their self-registration. Well, guess what? They do. They love it. And if they can't do it, they get someone else to help them on their iPad and it's all done. Language, gender and age did not interfere with people adopting any of our digital pathways. So that's great, particularly in an area like Liverpool where you've got a lot of called consumers. So I think I'm not a very patient person, but I'm learning to be more patient and persistent mm -hmm. um, and advocacy. And I think when we do connect through to purpose and, um, you know, we talk about why are we here, what are we here to achieve, that's the most powerful thing. So I think there's loads of future opportunities and I think we should be embracing data because it should be able to inform care, not just after we've done it, but in the moment. And I think the data are also really great to help us have the difficult conversation. Don't wait till someone's nearly at the point of arrest. If the prediction tool says this person's going to get sick, have that discussion why they, while they can make some choices um, and get into conscious design. I think people understand that when you explain it nice and logically, and it's going to help us deliver the right patient, the right treatment at the right time, in the right place, and with the resources that we need. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so stimulating. Um, and um, we have some questions, um, but they're specifically around um, some pathogenesis, some treatment of IBD. So we won't come to those now. We might address them after Clive was just discussing other things just that, about your talk. I just wonder, like, it's interesting, like, do you have any insight with the AIMSOF principle? That was just so impressive. And I'm just struck by we talk about silos. You've seen that data. How is do you have any insight into how that's going to be implemented? I mean, you've obviously done it in South Australia, but what's going to happen from a national perspective? Well, it's interesting because I saw this um, early on in 2020 when we were looking online for a results tracking system for our local health network. But we didn't see a results tracking system. We still don't get one of those, but I saw this. And it was interesting because nobody else in Australia is running anything like this. It was designed by a cardiothoracic surgeon and his then registrar, 
who now runs um, digital tech startup companies in the US. But, you know, they were sick of, you know, coming in in the morning and seeing patients that had been sick with saggy blood pressures and other things overnight, but they were still in between the flags. So nothing had been escalated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they went away and wrote some little algorithms, tested it, but they were having terrible difficulty getting anyone else to believe it was real. Um, so we will be their first um, large public hospital to go live. We've been running it um, on four trial wards for a while, and we've now got um, permission from Digital Health to build it into our EMR, and we're going to put up journey boards so that next to each patient you will get some other information, including your AIMSOP score. Fantastic. I guess that once it's been proven to work in a public hospital, then it can be potentially. That's the hope. That's yeah, the hope. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's so Because interesting. we don't all need to reinvent the wheel every time. No, exactly. Once that's it's done. done. Exactly. Yeah. I think that sort of comes to the point we're talking about, about not reinventing the wheel or all this silo business. Uh, and I think, um, I mean, it's it's so impressive what you've been doing. It's such a shame, I guess. I guess you've got to start somewhere. It's just wonderful that you're getting awareness around about around this. And do you? So I'm interested also in um, you know, so much about prehab, which also makes complete sense about the fact that you said that it wasn't. It didn't actually. It wasn't affected by by um, by language. No. Like about seventy five percent of our population here don't speak English as their first language. Mm -hmm. So do you have any? Do you want to give us more insight into that? Yeah, look, it's really interesting because when we started designing it and we went through a whole co-design thing with consumers and with GPs and huge allied health panel to try and make sure it was all appropriate, and people did bring up, they said, oh, look, that would be really bad because you've got to be you know, have access to digital tools, you've got to be able to read, you've got to be able to understand English, and they were important barriers to raise. But what we found is that there's usually someone in the family who's got English mm -hmm. and they will actually do things for other people. And then people say, oh, what about privacy? And I'm going, but hell, they're all living in the community. They're helping each other anyway. So our tool won't do 100% of things for 100% of people. Sure. But, but what it will do yeah. is it, it will take away some of the work that is repetitive that people can help themselves with. And that means we've got more time to help the people who really need our attention. So yeah. it's not, it's about segmenting the market a bit, like mm -hmm. saying, oh, these people are all good and they can help themselves, and then we've got a bit more headspace to do the tricky people. Or yeah, people yeah, I think that's so much. So I think if we come back to your sort of points at the very beginning, you talk about effective, appropriate, reliable and safe, and also I love that acronym of ETO. Oh, yeah, efficiency, efficiency, thoroughness, trade-off. Yeah. Um, I thought that was just amazing. And I just wanted one final thing, that actually to be the... Um, there's currently a task force in New South Wales Ministry is actually running an out trying to work out how we're going to manage our outpatients demand. And I just wondered oh, maybe scoring systems, digital screening, I think that it's it's all doable actually. Yes. We've got to work together though. Yes. So we recently in South Australia set up several panels for the high referral specialties and I chaired the gastroenterology panel. Right. And Queensland have done it some years back in Victoria, yeah. but I don't think it's been operationalised fully, but it's looking at clinical prioritisation criteria to say, you know, you, you, really, it's like a mandatory uh, form. Like, you know, if you've got to book a flight or a hotel, if you don't fill in all the fields, you can't submit your referral. Mm -hmm. So a lot of GPs are absolutely fantastic. However, at the specialist end, we end up chasing a lot of data from the GPs who aren't fantastic. Yes. Who don't tell us everything about people. Yes. So we will, we can structure a referral template so that we get the right information. So that then, if all the boxes are green and you can use a traffic light scoring system, then that person can either be given an IBS diagnosis and given self help information, or we can see, oh, actually, they've got iron deficiency and they're fifty five and they've never had a cold one. We're pulling them straight in, mm -hmm. and they'll get a scope next week. So you can use the system to score people and distribute the work to the right place. Yeah, so it's so like it's a right place, right person, right time. So, I mean, yes, absolutely. So, look, I'm conscious of time. We've just got two more minutes. I'm just going to get a couple of questions just more, more specifically around, um, around some questions um, about treatment. Um, so the first one is what do you think about FMT as a treatment for Crohn's disease? Um, do you want to answer that one, Jane? Because yeah. you've done some work in FMT and Jane has actually published, yes. Yeah. So our trial was run by Sam Costello, who was one of my PhD students, and he did a great job running a trial in ulcerative colitis um, with FMT, and it was an effective therapy um, for induction of remission. 
It's not actually been shown to be very effective in Crohn's disease. There have been a number of studies done, and interestingly, unlike the UC area, where there were four trials, um, all of three were positive initially, and another one was nearly positive. And when the meta analysis was done, clearly in UC there's a consistent effect. But in Crohn's, we're either not using it the right way or it's not effective. And it's a bit of a mystery. Um, so we're not there yet with that one. And I think to the second question, that sort of there has actually been some work done. This next question is of what do we think of antibiotics as a treatment for Crohn's? Well, I think there are areas in which we do use antibiotics to treat certain parts of Crohn's, for example, perianal disease. We try to control sepsis, and we know that it works very well, hand in hand with therapies. But there was a trial many years ago done, actually led by Australia, showing that combination and uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis treatment did not actually work in the context of long-term yeah, treatment. Yeah, right. And that was a well-done study. It was a very well-done study. But, I mean, there's still sort of interest in this area, but at the moment hasn't been shown in, that, yeah. in any, any large and well-constructed studies that antibiotics do, in fact, can be used as, as a sole treatment for Crohn's disease. Dan, um, there's a question here about mental health, and Jane's done a lot published internationally in mental health. We might just quickly talk to that before we get Rose to talk, um, talk to um, introduce your patient experience. Look, um, I think mental health is hugely important in IBD, and we've done quite a lot of work there. It's probably hugely important just in terms of physical health care in any case and across all the complex chronic disorders. What we found was that screening our patients um, with IBD when they you know, came to clinic and all people who were new to the service revealed there was a big mental health um, gap that we weren't seeing. So people would come in, they'd speak to the doctor, they were fine, and they'd gloss over stuff. Um, when we started doing the screening tools on a regular basis, we found that about 20% of our ambulatory walking cohort went all the way through to needing, accepting and engaging with mental health support. And the great thing was that um, that generated better engagement in care and slightly increased costs over the next year. But then in year two, the healthcare utilisation of the costs all dropped away. And we think that that's because people really got their mental health sorted. They were then able to engage in better strategies, better engagement in their care and um, things improved both mentally and physically for them. Mm. So we do that now as a routine. Mm. I might just, before we get on to Rose, because there's going to be lots of questions I think to Rose as well, this is specifically about your talk. I often find families, patients, nice. community expectations drive poor quality health care, particularly at the extremes of age. How do you think the medical profession best deals with this systematic? I mean, it's a big question, but it's a it very is. important question. Yeah. Look, it's something I'm really interested in, and I thank you for the question. Mm. I think that your statement can be true, and I think that it, it happens that way because we don't communicate very well with people. I think that the, the families and the patients and the community expectations only are driving the poor quality health care because we don't step into that awkward conversation and actually speak to people compassionately and with time about what is the realistic outcome. I used to be a general physician some years ago. I also worked in nursing homes on the way through um, medical school. I did two shifts every weekend, and I don't know anyone who is bed-bound in a nursing home who wants to be saved to spend another 10 years bed-bound in a nursing home. And I think it's really important to look at the patient holistically and be prepared to ask, what would you want if it were you? And, you know, then have that conversation with people. And sometimes it gets messy. You sometimes, you know, don't let the infection control people here, but um, sometimes you have to give people a hug. You sit on the edge of the bed. You know, you, you have to be, you have to be real. You have to actually be prepared to be a bit upset yourself and you can have the best conversations. And it's usually lovely once you step in there and have that conversation. And I think some of the, there's opportunities also in the digital space potentially to help clinicians make um, care. Uh, Absolutely. So, so showing the clinician the risk. Um, our wow. digital health people in um, SA Health now have been for the last couple of years working out the mortality risk score for all our admitted inpatients within the next 12 months. Yes. And we're now having the conversation as to how do we display this in the EMR so that the clinician and the family and the patient get this information so that if they know, oh, I've likely only got, you know, 12 months left, what would I like to choose to do with my last 12 months? Do I want to come in and out of hospital? Yes. Or do right. I want to make other plans? 
So that would be really helpful as well to be implementing oh, so. Yeah, wonderful. So now, look, I'd love, I want to now go on to, to introduce Rose, who is um, going to be talking about um, her, well, she's going to be, it's going to go to the next slide so the team can see that. The, the, um, it's just not moving, sorry. There we go. So this is from Rose Mitchell, and she's going to be talking about her journey with Crohn's disease and flushing the sick stigma. Thank you so much, Rose, for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, Life with Crohn's disease has uh, been a bit of a roller coaster. Um, I guess I can say that uh, throughout my life I've had periods of uh, remission, periods of active disease. Um, I'm just coming out of a period of active disease now, but as you can see on the screen there, uh, my life has been th uh, I've gone through many different phases, uh, some in hospital, some uh, taking medications in hospital for infusions. Uh, that cute little kid over there didn't have any health problems, really. And um, in the last photo where I'm behind the Life is Beautiful sign over a day of drive there, um, it was my first trip overseas alone. And um, I managed to do that while managing my IBD symptoms as well. And for sure, even through all of the difficulties of life, with IBD is beautiful. Um, some of the symptoms that I've experienced through my life with IBD though have included uh, diarrhea, bloody stools, uh, constipation even thanks to anal stenosis and, um, and perianal disease in the past as well. And um, stomach pain, uh, abdo abdominal pain in general really. So. Uh, there's never really been any sort of specific area that has caused me pain with Crohn's, but uh, most recently in my last flare, left sided pain in particular, and that's where the inflammation was found on endoscopy. Um, I've had a lot of extra intestinal manifestations of Crohn's as well. So uh, I've had everything from poor teeth to joint pain to. Um, if I have brain fog, there you go. <laughs> so, um, brain fog has actually impacted me quite significantly. I used to be a high school teacher and I'd be teaching lessons, and I would say something in class. And I remember this one incident quite specifically. I was teaching a lesson on plate tectonics, and I said the word plate tectonics maybe five times in the space of 10 minutes. And then a couple of minutes later, I needed to say plate tectonics again, and the words had just escaped me. So brain fog is quite a significant uh, extra intestinal manifestation of Crohn's there. And I believe that um, that the, the understanding is that that can come from anemia, it can come from dealing with constant chronic pain as well. But there's also some schools of thought that believe that it's, it's quite an unknown and not everybody with Crohn's experiences it or IBD experiences it, but a lot of people do. Another, um, another symptom that has impacted me throughout my life with Crohn's as well is fatigue. I don't remember a time of my life where I didn't experience fatigue on some level. So um, it, it has definitely had a massive impact on my life. And in a perfect world, I would love to be a doctor, but I know that I physically wouldn't be able to cope with doing that job because of the fatigue that I experienced and the chronic pain that I experienced. Oh, getting a little bit emotional there. <laughs> but, but, Life is great, thank you so much. <laughs> Life is great with Crohn's. I've experienced so much. I've achieved many, many things throughout my life as well. So I don't want anybody with IBD who's watching this today to think that um, it's a death sentence. I don't want anybody to think that they need to stop doing everything that they're doing because they are sick, because there will be times where you can do things and, yes, you will experience times where you're bed bound or you're in hospital but those times are fleeting and something that a nurse that I um that I had the I guess pleasure of being taken care of by throughout my time in the gastro ward was 
these two shall pass. So she reminded me through every difficult period that I experienced and every admission that I had in the gastro ward that every state is temporary and those states most certainly were temporary. As you can see, there's a photo of me up there um, from a ward right after endoscopy because I try to document things as much as possible um, to remind me of those difficult times and how far I've come. And um, I've got to say that I know a lot of people with IBD who have come very far in their lives as well and have experienced similar issues in their lives. Something that um, I also want to address is the stigma associated with it and the burdens of having IBD because I guess we'll start with stigma because people will look at you when you say you have IBD and they'll say something along the lines of, but you don't look sick. They may say, oh, my neighbour's husband's brother's cousin's partner or whoever has that and they're fine and they cured it with, I don't know, some sort of snake oil cure. So they, they don't have an understanding of it and I guess most people are well-meaning when they say these things but um, it, it's difficult to deal with people saying that you don't look sick when you know very well that you are sick. It's also difficult for people to uh, not accommodate your needs when you're sick as well. So we've, we've talked about um, the issues with perianal disease, we've talked about mental health issues as well and when people are not so sensitive to the needs of somebody with IBD. It makes things even more work. So it's not that it's, not that it's uh, disheartening, it's not that it's um, offensive, it's a lot more work. And whether that is educating those people in terms of what you need from them with, your, with regard to your IBD, or whether it is getting around those misconceptions, um, you, you do have to work a lot harder. And it's not just people that you come across, it's day-to-day -day relationships as well. I found that I had to educate my family for a very long time before they really understood what my needs were as an IBD patient. They thought that it was just depression. They thought just depression. <laughs> They, they thought that, you know, for a long time I was just lazy. For a long time I was looked at as the sick one and I was pitied when I never asked anybody for pity and a lot of people with IBD can relate to that as well. We don't ask for pity, we ask for understanding, we ask for compassion and we ask for equity. And a lot of people think that by pitying us, they are giving us equity when really that's not the case. I don't want people saying to me, I'm so sorry you're sick, but most of us don't. I want people to see where I've come from and what I'm achieving and how far this disease has brought me and made me the person that I am and say, wow, in spite of everything that you've gone through, you have done so many things and just to just to let you know if anybody with IBD is watching I have um, multiple degrees I work full-time I um, I competitively ballroom dance for a very long time as well um, that's that's a huge physical task so it's um, something that I'm incredibly proud of and that was all after diagnosis too so I'm I work hard, but, you know, nothing good ever comes without hard work anyway. So there's, there's a, lot of, um, a lot of stigma attached, and I've worked very hard to take that stigma away from the people around me. And I've created a bit of an online community as well to try to assist in flushing the stigma. I've also started uh, working in advocacy, and I work with a pharmaceutical company to try to assist patients who may still have a lot of misconceptions about the illness as well, because I know that when I was first diagnosed, I had very little understanding of what IBD meant other than what I'd read online. So this was 2008. 
and read online that it was inflammation in the in the digestive tract and it caused the symptoms that I that I was experiencing. But other than that, I didn't realize how invasive it was and how you, you need so much patience in terms of treatment because medication is trial and error a lot of the time. Um, I had tried maybe 10 different medications before I was put on infliximab, which is the first thing that really worked for me in, um, in getting me into remission. If you look at the photos again and you see the top middle photo, that was me a few months prior to diagnosis and I was probably the sickest I could possibly be. Yet people were telling me I looked amazing. So um, I look at that face and I see someone incredibly ill, not someone who looks good. Um, but after that and after being under the care of Professor Connor, who put me on infliximab and I'm incredibly grateful for, um, I started to get better and I went into remission for the first time in a very, very long time. And I, I learned that life could be good. Before that, my mental health had suffered so much because people didn't believe that I was sick. People were telling me that I was lazy. People were not understanding of the fact that if I needed a bathroom, I needed a bathroom and there was no getting around that. So, it, you know, those things really, really impact your self-esteem, your self-worth, and they, they make you feel less than and inadequate. And it took a long time after achieving the mission for me to be able to gain the confidence that I have now. And I, I did that in conjunction with assistance from Professor Connor, from um, Dr. Williams as well, who took me on um, a couple of years ago. And it, it, that was a long road in itself and a journey that, um, that I wouldn't have undertaken had I not had IVD because I would have just been that kid who wanted to achieve everything humanly possible. Um, those instances as well, and um, working with Professor Connor and Dr. Williams also put a lot of things into perspective for me and made me realise that I don't have to run and achieve everything. Um, yes, I am an overachiever, but I've, I've toned that down a little. And um, they've made me appreciate life so much more and my family so much more. And I have enjoyed life uh, a lot more than I would have had I not achieved remission when I did and not sort of been in remission for as long as I was as well. So I was in remission for about nine years with infliximab and, um, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. I uh, had to come off it in 20, at the end of 2020 and started Stellara in 2021 which kept me in remission for another year, but um, unfortunately, early this year, I went into another flare, which brings me to my next point, those periods of active flare versus remission. So when someone is in remission, they, they may still have some symptoms of IBD, so there may be some urgency still. There may be still some joint pain, um, fatigue, brain fog, and the like, but... When someone with IBD goes into an active flare, your body gives you those signals to tell you that you are in an active flare and, um, and it's almost as though when I went into this flare, my body said, you need to slow down and you need to slow down right now. Um, I just started a new job. Um, I wasn't particularly stressed. I was actually the happiest I've ever been in my life and the least stressed I've ever been in my life. So I'm not sure what the trigger for this flare was, but I started losing blood in my stool. I started to feel even more fatigued than usual. My joint pain increased quite significantly. My abdominal pain uh, significantly increased as well. So I knew that at that at that point, so within a within a week or so of those symptoms starting, I really believed that I was in quite some flare. 
So um, in the past, I'd probably had a day or two of bleeding here and there, nothing too significant. And I've always sort of understood my body. And if I'd had a little bit of bleeding or a little bit of abdominal pain or a little bit more fatigue than usual for a couple of days, I, I'd sort of disregard it and I wouldn't be too worried because I felt like it would pass and it might just be a little blip. Whereas if it goes on for more than a week, the body knows and you know you kind of have an understanding of your own body and its patterns to know that this is a flare and this something needs to be done. So I am incredibly lucky to be within the Liverpool Hospital area and um, and dealing with the IBD nurses, I can send an email and you know, tell the nurses what my symptoms are. They refer to the doctors and um, and we go from the you know investigation start and um, and I guess the, the diagnosis of flare occurs after that. Um, unfortunately, this year, even though we started the investigations, I ended up in the emergency department and I was admitted for uh, just under a week. And we had we had some investigations and I had a anal dilatation as well because of that stenosis. And I um, came out of the hospital on a high dose of steroids, which you know, helps with active flare. I don't enjoy them. Uh, my face does not enjoy them either. But uh, they did the job and they got me to a point where I was very close to remission and continuing with the Stellara. I, did you say that I'm back in remission now? Yep, okay. So I'm back in remission now. Yes, I hope so too. But um, there's, there's also research that suggests in terms when talking about medication, that um, vitamin D assists, and um, we we do also need to take care of our bones with IBD too, because we're at higher risk of osteoporosis. So vitamin D is having <laughs> critical in me, sort of maintaining my my overall health within this. Um, I guess on that note, though, um, not everything is going to work for everyone. And we have already addressed this to a certain extent, but I want people who are watching this who have IBD and people and, and anyone else, clinicians as well, to understand that just because one thing does not work, it doesn't mean that all hope is lost as well. Um, a lot of people can feel really defeated when uh, they don't have the results that they expected from a particular medication or a particular treatment that may not be a medication. Um, and that persistence is so important within this uh, disease. And um, I guess that determination to succeed is important as well because we need to ensure that the medications that we take or the medications that we give are uh, you know, not, the, not the only sort of means of treatment as well. Um, I do believe as well that using programs like uh, Crohn's Colitis Care have helped me personally with my journey with Crohn's disease because I'm very vigilant in keeping track of you know, my bowel motions, my diet, my, um, my other symptoms as well. And I try to make connections as much as possible between those so I can inform the medical teams that I work with to give me the best care possible because I believe that my job as a patient is to make my clinician's jobs easier. And in that way, I mean, if I make my clinician's jobs easier, then they can, all, they can make my life better and work smarter, not harder, to make my, my life better. And uh, Crohn's Colitis Care is a wonderful way of keeping track of what is happening when I relay the information through to the team and, um, and also recognising patterns because I, I don't have to do that anymore. And that is, uh, that is a wonderful uh, relief for me. It's a burden that has been taken away from me as well because I've always felt that I needed to stay on top of every single detail. And that sort of thing can actually impact your mental health as well as a patient because 
you're so anxious about making sure you don't forget anything, whereas, uh, yeah, CCC can really take care of all of that for you. And I'm incredibly grateful for that and for all of the hard work of the teams that I have worked with. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. I just want to thank you so much for asking. I I just want to. I mean, how old were you, Rose, when you were diagnosed? I was twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. Yeah, and I'm forty-one now. So yeah. you've been living with this illness now for like it's now 40, 15 years, isn't it? Yeah, about that. Yeah, so it's a long time, and the journey is still. You still got potentially another sort of. 50 years of this potential, 40 years maybe, depending, 50 years, you're going to live to 60 and maybe live to 100. I think your resilience um, is just incredible and I, I hope everyone will be, um, you know, it can just experience, um, you know, the amount of resilience um, that you're demonstrating. I think this is not alone in terms of the people you know in the IBD community. Absolutely. I wonder if you just reflect on since you've had this disease, the, the Crohn's disease since 2008, how do you get your reflection on the awareness of these illnesses from 2008 to now? And what do you feel as, as a community, as an Australian community, we might do for people like you going forward? So first, you know, before and, and where to come here. Okay, so um, when I was first diagnosed, um, or even before that, there was very little awareness of IBD in Australia. Um, I think I first came into contact with Crohn's and Colitis Australia um, 2014, 2015, something like that. So it was a good six or seven years post-diagnosis before I even knew Friends and Colitis Australia existed. Mm -hmm. um, and that in itself is a bit of an issue because they don't have the funding that they need to promote themselves well enough within the community. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's improved now, but I also believe that because I sort of surround myself with, uh, with advocates and, and friends with the illness as well, that we're more exposed to it because we, we kind of sort of tie ourselves to it. Um, I, when I hear of people who are recently diagnosed, they're not aware of it. And I think that we really need to raise further awareness within clinics, within, um, within hospitals, within the community in general as well. Um, I've found as well that Instagram is a beautiful place for creating communities, uh, regardless of the chronic illness that you're that you're dealing with, um, Instagram has these amazing communities of people that really love to help each other and encourage each other. So there's, there's ambassadors from Crohn's and Colitis Australia that I'm friends with now on Instagram who will encourage me daily and I encourage them and we give each other the strength that we need to continue fighting this illness and that is something that I never would have expected when I was first diagnosed. So the linking with other people and, and, and I guess there's more and more people out there with these illnesses, so there's more opportunity mm -hmm. to connect with people. And yes. I guess also if anyone out there is feeling alone, you know, look at the Crohn's Colitis Australia website or the Crohn's Colitis Cure as well, just to be able to have a way of linking in with people so you don't feel quite as alone. We know that, you know, there's nearly three times an instance of mental health in this illness. Um, I wonder if you might just, for a moment, just reflect on the impact on your mental health. Because you've been, I mean, you show amazing resilience and positivity, but I know how difficult it is with this illness. And you, you're an amazing example of someone that's, you know, you know, gone through, oh, I'm sorry, you've just done so <laughs> much. It's been, I don't think anyone out there really understands, but you've given a very, you know, amazingly humble account of what has been, I think, an incredibly difficult journey. And this is like very reflective of many, I mean, most of the patients that we see. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, your mental health is your to it. And, and yeah. I think, you know, you've obviously got lots of friends who, and I'm not trying to put, you know, like, it's just about just understanding how it does impact on that, that sort of oh. shame and the sort of, the, just the impact on anxiety, you lose your control, those sort of things. It's just, you know, it's just, it impacts every part of your quality of life in many ways, doesn't it? Then, then. It absolutely does. Um, I guess 
from from the beginning, um, not realising how much of an impact it would continue to have on me on first diagnosis, I was extremely happy because my mother and I thought I was going to die at that point. And um, when diagnosed with Crohn's disease, we wanted to throw a party because we didn't really understand the impact of it. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but as time went on and my symptoms got worse because my medication wasn't working, um, I, I became more withdrawn from my friends and I lost a lot of friends. I did have multiple accidents um, and didn't make it to the bathroom quite often. So um, that is that, that brings shame on a person when they're not used to it. Um, even today, if that sort of thing was to happen, I would I would feel quite ashamed of myself and disappointed in my body for failing me. But um, I, I get over that much more quickly now than I would have in the past. Um, there's also uh, the anxiety around being able to do the things that you would normally do. So a lot of people feel like they can't work anymore because they they don't feel comfortable in a workplace environment, whether they um, whether they need to rush to the bathroom or whether they've got a stoma. And managing those sorts of issues in a workplace can be quite difficult for a person's mental health. Um, the depression that all of that creates as well, it's sort of a, it's, it's a spiral. And I will admit that I went down the spiral and probably more than once during my time with IBD and um, and getting out of that funk is quite difficult. So it's so important to speak to professionals, speak to the people around you, speak to your clinicians as well because, believe it or not, they actually see what we're going through and will suggest things, but I guess can't force anything on us. But, you know, they, they do try to help and they do want to help and make our quality of life so much better. Um, the most important thing I've learned in terms of mental health, though, is to lean on those around you because regardless of what someone says or, you know, if someone thinks that you're lazy within your family, you can count on them and you can trust them to be there for you during your worst times. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, Leanne Raven, who is CEO of the CCA, has, you know, just said how what an amazing, inspirational presentation, Rosemary. Thanks for sharing your experience. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Leanne. Look, um, it's, um, I, I just wanted to thank everyone so far for their contribution and, and Alex and Joe, just want to talk about how everyone out there might, what we do and then other things we do and also how you might be involved. Thank you so much, Rose. Your incredible courage and resilience is, I hate playing, but an absolute inspiration to me in life. And the journey that you have walked and we've hopefully walked closely beside you um, is, is, is where you are now as a real testament to you as a human. Yeah, and the inspiration of giving to so many other people. Okay. Yeah, I'll get all those to me. Yes, thank okay. you. I, I couldn't have done it without both of you. <laughs> <laughs> and and, 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 and yeah. absolutely, absolutely. But, um, I just want to quickly make mention of the two people beside me. Um, been with them through for every step of this journey, and I am I have no words to express my gratitude because it is that great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're just going to quickly talk a little bit um, about I think so one slide back. Yeah, so talk, in talking about our research, um it's not just limited to uh, our four core priorities. So our research actually um, is very clinically based as well. We have an interest in uh, pregnancy and pediatric transition, which we actually run uh, pregnancy and uh, clinics and pediatric transition clinics here at Liverpool Hospital. Um, we're looking at new drugs all the time, so we participate um, in clinical trials. Um, we're looking at subcut biologic drug administration uh, and remote monitoring. Um, as well as lots of other areas of um, uncharted territory in IBD, and that's what we're dealing with often. I think the panel would agree, uh, will agree that every, everything is um, uncharted in this space, so lots of things are uncharted, but we don't need to reinvent the wheel. So those are our kind of our research interests um, in addition to the four core priorities, which Susie mentioned earlier, as value-based healthcare, um, patient communication and decision aid, 
perianal Crohn's disease, uh, and obviously the aims to be. Um, so how can you help? Well, the biggest thing, and, and one of the things that's very close to our hearts and also Rose's heart, um, is to raise awareness of inflammatory bowel disease. As I mentioned earlier, we probably actually all know someone in our, in our family or close group of friends um, that has inflammatory bowel disease, but it's not something that people uh, talk about. I mean, Rose was sat here and talked about anal dilatation. That's not something that that's get spoken about um, in general conversation. So, you know, reach out to um, to people you know and actually start talking about inflammatory bowel disease. It's incredibly important. Um, you can obviously donate to the cause. Um, you can do that. The, the uh, QR code up there on your screen takes you to the Crohn's Colitis QR website. Um, you can also donate to Crohn's Colitis Australia. You can donate um, to our research efforts uh, via the Ingham Institute website or the donate um, tab on the South Western Sydney Local Health District website. Um, and there will be uh, links to those provided with the recording um, of this showcase. Um, and you can also participate. So if you're living, if you're someone living with inflammatory bowel disease, talk to your clinician about <laughs> actually participating in research. It's incredibly important. And there are always um, opportunities to participate in research. Um, and if you're not someone living with IBD, uh, there is also opportunities to participate as a control um, in many of the different studies. So reach out to your clinicians and really talk about those opportunities for you. Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. I'd just like to invite Liz to, um, to close. Well, thank you very much indeed. And what a magnificent occasion and Rose. What a, what a wonderful presentation. I feel ever so humble standing behind you. Um, <laughs> so I've, I've been involved with inflammatory bowel disease for well over 50 years. Uh, as a surgeon, I became a surgeon because I met a patient that asked to provide us at Sydney Hospital many, many years ago. And then I went on to become a colorectal surgeon. I trained at the team clinic where I learned about sternal therapy. And then I treated many, many patients uh, with osteocolitis and Crohn's disease. And I did all of my research in developing pouches and content in the ostomies of Sweden. And then I developed osteocolitis myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I listened to Rose and said, what a brave lady Rose is and how many you know, how many episodes you've been through, and I'm ever so proud to, to have you here, Rose, and thank you very much indeed, you've given me an opportunity. <laughs> um, we've seen also today, you know, that the treatment of inflammatory bowel diseases is, is a cooperative treatment. It's, it's, um, it's community, it's um, um, organisations like Crohn's Colitis, it's uh, nursing colleagues, it's allied health, it's psychology, it's the neighbor next door, it's the friend who's had, knows somebody who's had Crohn's or osteocolitis. It's the uh, physician who takes a special interest and understands what osteocolitis is in particular and what it means to the patient's daily life. And of course, it's the surgeon who sometimes is called in to help, but it's, it is truly one of the very few uh, conditions where teamwork is absolutely necessary. And that's why South to Sydney LHD um, supported this very important research work. And, and now we have the digital era bringing um, digitization and digital health to a chronic illness. And Susie, what you and your colleagues have done uh, here and in, in, in uh, Adelaide is, is applicable to so many chronic illnesses. And I think this is a platform that we can that we can use. So to everyone who's participated in this symposium, and Susie in particular, you and so nice to have our colleagues from, <laughs> from <laughs> South Australia who worked with me in, in Concord well, when I was only 10 years old. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed. Um, um, I'd like to invite all of you to uh, to the next seminar, which is going to be um, which is going to be our best start, and uh, it's going to be hosted by Professor Valsa Ethan. And this is a really special symposium. Uh, Valsa Ethan is a is a is a global uh, phenomenon. She understands um, uh, human development from almost preconception onwards. And she gives an insight on how we can manage 
early in life, right when we're one and two years of age, the illnesses and the conditions that would affect us in later years, um, even my later years at the age of 20 on. <laughs> so um, can I thank you all for participating? Can I thank the directorate and Rachel and Anna Maria de Souza for doing such a wonderful job? And also Tegan and the Ingham Institute um, for hosting this and I bring this wonderful meeting to a close. Thank you very much.